that makes sense, right? If you, you're spinning something that's close, it's easy to spin, but we put the things way out wide and you try to spin it, it takes a lot of energy. In fact, there's all kinds of really fancy, the physics is so complex when you get to the human body that they're still working out ways to figure out how to de actually determine it. But if I put something at the end of my foot down by my ankle, even if it's 200 grams, that's a lot of energy that my body has to learn how to control. So whether I'm starting and I have to pull through or I'm stopping to bring it back down, that's going to cause a, a huge shift in my body to actually stop that extra weight. And there's a math equation that shows that I didn't understand it completely, so I didn't put it up there. And rotational inertia is all that stuff moving around. So whether you've got this body mass moving forward, you have these other things that are rotating around that need to be exercised or strengthened. So the way I saw it was, well, here's the research. And there's been a ton of research on the wearables. But with 200 grams on the calf, required 12% more muscular effort to accelerate and decelerate the limbs with minimal change in velocity. And I think the velocity change was between 4 and 6%. So I had athletes, I lend out, I bought a bunch of stuff. I don't know, I, and I, I'll tell you why I did it wrong in a second. Go out, put the sleeves on, the shanks on for the calves, they call it the shank, and went out and ran, did 200 meter run, Normally, you know, yeah, I know what it feels like. They died. Physics. Physics was proved right there. It just, they said it took so much more energy. Once, once I was up to speed and I was going, it just kind of, it wore me down. And so here's all the joint motions that we're looking at here. That's one of my favorite ones. So here's how I use it. And some of the stuff I don't have the wearables. I went old school. Uh, but this is from research that has been accumulated over about 30 years. There's a guy down in New Zealand. His name is John Cronin. He's actually one of the head researchers in sprinting and in the world. Uh, he's behind a lot of things. You'll see his name third or fourth on the list on the research papers where like my name is. Um, but he knows a lot and he's a really interesting guy because he's like me. He was a, a rugby player who always wanted to be faster and he has spent his whole life researching this and now he's 60 some and he runs the entire sports, de sports research department in Auckland, University of Auckland, which believe it or not is the largest or one of the largest research centers in that in the world in sports science. So he's got a lot of really good information. So he put together this paper that was released last year and looked at where, what happens when you put weights at different parts of the body. Uh, for trunk loading, it's really good for max velocity. And I've tried all this stuff with my athletes and it, and it works really well. Uh, less than 20% of body mass improves, uh, the research was 20, less than 20% of body mass improved between 1.2 and 6.6% 6 .6 in 30 to 50 meter range in acceleration. And what they're challenging is the reactive strength when you have that extra load coming down and you have to bounce up again. And I think what's really important here is if you want to try some of this stuff, is it can't move. Once the weight moves, and I've tried this, it's different. So I did some other stuff here to show you guys that you don't have to buy all this stuff. So here's some stuff in the, the basement. So this is going along with Ken and I talked about. You want to hit it again? I swear I had this all set up. So this is going along with Ken where you're talking about repositioning the legs from a, from a split squat. And so he's going to jump up with that weight and it's about 20 pounds on him. And I've got it strapped down with a big Velcro strap and then land on one foot and pop up, so you're working that reflex. I'll hit the next one, hit play again, 
And this is just a simple uh, lunge with a split. Again, working on what Ken and I talked about. And with the weight, it gets really hard. And what's really cool is the fact that with that extra weight, you can't jump as high, so your legs have to scissor back faster to catch yourself. So again, it's an overspeed of the reflex. So you just have like weight on her and then like a compression top to kind of hold that in place? That's exactly what I have. <laughs> Nothing fancy. This is what I call my sprinter vertical jump. Hit it again. It's just like what she did. A split jump up in the air. Uh, I'm going to move it. This is the sprinter vertical jump. So again, you're challenging the, the speed of the reflex. And I don't let them load. Uh, limb loading, this is where it gets fun. The great thing about this is you can put these things all over the place. And the more you move away from your center of mass, the more difficult it becomes. And what I have found is it's a great way that you can get that verbal cue that you've got to stomp down. You know, there's cool research about the slower you are, the more horizontal movement your foot has, the less vertical force you have into the ground. When you have that weight, and again, it's only 200 grams, it, it's like this immediate cue that they've got to stomp down on the ground. And that was another thing that, you know, the foot from above, that concept, and it had a big impact. And what they're really interested in is the acceleration phase of that, where you're accelerating with the weights on your limbs. And again, it's more of that drive coming down. But from another interesting standpoint, looking at it from a rotational aspect, with that extra weight on your ankle and that foot coming down, you have to increase your eccentric strength with that speed coming down. Your hamstring has to grab that much more with that extra weight and the added velocity, because just from the velocity, the extra weight coming down, it's coming down faster. And that's kind of the magic button that everyone's talking about these days, is the eccentric strength of your hamstring when it's about to hit the ground. They just came out with a paper on that, again, this last year, and at the big hamstring conference in Perth, Australia, this last week, that was one of the things that they came up with. So how have I used them? So, Here's what you don't do, like I did. Buy everything, except the ones that are really important. So I bought everything but the calf, because I figured the calf, what the hell is that going to do? Who, who cares? So I bought that, I bought that, I bought that, I bought that, and I bought mul multiple ones so we could have different people use them at the same time. It was a lot of money. And then I actually talked to Joseph, the guy who owns the company, he goes, no, you just need the calf ones. <laughs> And she got to be kidding me. He goes, yeah, the calf ones. Everyone starts with just the calf ones. In fact, you'll probably never need anything more than the calf ones. Really? Yeah. What were you thinking? I thought, well, I wanted to look like Spider-Man. <laughs> and where are that? And he goes, uh, that's later on down the road. And if you think of it from a physics standpoint, that's the, that's the furthest away. Um, the center of mass, so it's going to require the greatest energy. In fact, what we found out is you just can't put them on and go run because you'll be wrecked for a week. I did that to myself. I had to see. You know, I bought all this stuff. I went out and went as hard as I could to see what happened to me first, and I couldn't walk for about a week. My hamstrings were... Remember the first time you squatted and you couldn't sit on the toilet for like a week? <laughs> it was that. But I'm 50, and it's not so much fun when you're 50. So the calves are where you start. Um, and if you're going to buy them for your team, do the two for one because they send you a lot of weights and you're never going to use all that weight. I shouldn't be telling this because he wants to make money, but I'm just telling you that's learning from my lesson. Because if you come to my house now, there are the, these weights all over the place. And the Velcro is unlike anything you've seen before. When it gets stuck to you, it's on you. It's a three minute process to get this thing. It's like having burrs on you. That's how much it sticks. And they are really tight and they run small. So you want to go probably go up a size. 
Oh, so how, when we put them on, we start with our running drills. We did two weeks of just our running drills, our, you know, our boom booms and things like that. And that was a plenty enough response where people were sore the next day. And it was mostly all hamstring that they felt it. From there, we started putting on, you know, I have a kid that runs in college and we had to bulk him up a little bit and we started using the thighs. Um, and again, we started light and we started high and we moved our way down a way toward the ankle and then we went up in weight and then we started again and moved our way down. So if you think about it from a variability standpoint and variations in your training, every time you move that weight, it's different. In fact, if you put them vertically, it's going to feel different than if you wrap them around. And if you put them on the side, it feels different than when you put them somewhere else. So what you can kind of do is you can kind of manipulate a curve runner by where you position those weights and you can train them a little bit better so they have to have more whip coming around so they get a better step around on the curve. Kind of like how I jacked up Tony's kid last year before the 4x1. Pretty good. That was one of my better tricks. Yeah, that, that was uh, a magic one. And here's the crazy part, guys, and I have proof right here that this actually happens. Because his son, uh, we've worked him a long time, good distance runner, but his form was still a little bit off, so we used him as a guinea pig. Again, science, and we did the equations up on the board, and we started putting the weights at different places to make his body fight it so it's going to not rotate so much or move around so much. So Quinn had a, a kick, you know, this distance runner, how many people have seen this kid? I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, you know, the kid that kind of comes back a little bit too far on one side. So that was Quinn. And so what we did is we put the vest on him, now I was happy I had the vest, and we put 200, 300 grams on his side here. So if he kicked too far, and again, it's stuck to you. It's not like it moves and the weight goes this way. It is stuck to you. And if he, he started going like this, it would take his body too far, so his body learned to rotate and hold in place. And Mike, what happened? It looked like a different kid. It looked like a different kid. We did four runs. So then we got excited and we go, okay, now we're going to start to play. The next thing Quinn did was he shuffled in a little bit when he hit the ground. How many people have seen the kid that shuffles in a little bit when they hit the ground that you don't hear the clear click, but you hear like a, a scuffle? Half the time I train in the dark at my house, so I learn to listen instead of see because I can't see anything. They won't give me a street light. So we put the pants on and we put the weights on his butt to counterbalance his pelvis to hold it in place more. And Mike, what happened? Hips rotated back. Hips rotated back. It was hard to get that one off the foot. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's bad when you're in the driveway and the two of us are grabbing a kid in his butt trying to rip something off of his butt. I'm glad the police didn't come by. So we got his pelvis to rotate around because the body learned that it was just enough of a give to say, hey, too much, don't do it. Then we started weighting his arms way far away because he kind of had a counter rotation. You know, he swung a little bit. And what happened, Mike? And came back in. Came back in right away. right away. It was just enough that the brain said, yeah, this is wrong. Let's go, let's try this other way. Oh yeah, that's it. So Quinn's been our guinea pig for the last four or five weeks. And even one day it was raining, we went out, we didn't care. We had to go try it. So it's been, it's been a really wild thing that such a small amount of weight was enough of a cue to the body to say, no, nah, no more. Let's try something different. And has he been running better? Yeah, it's definitely more about it. Yeah, it was a, in a month we completely changed a kid. And I've been working with him for a couple of years, so I did my best. But yeah, it, it's been a, a wild thing. Again, it costs a lot more energy to move. So if you're training like 23 second runs and doing things like that and you want to get more bang for your buck and you really want to push the, the boundaries of that energy level, Again, it's going to cost a lot more to run. So I can't wait to actually take my track kids out and try that one day. Well, it probably won't be until with the way the weather is June when I get to run outside again, but it'll be exciting to see. I was in a Monty Python thing when I was doing this. 
So this is the other thing that I got into. Anyone familiar with blood flow restriction? So this is kind of crazy stuff too. And I blame this one on Cal, because Cal was raving about it. Cal uses his son for a guinea pig too. So, but Cal has like omega wave and all that stuff to test it all out to see if it works. So Cal is the one that got me onto it. And again, the goal of triphasic, and the reason why he liked this so much is because you can change muscle tissue and create a hormonal response. That's the goal of triphasic. And if you think about it, that's a much better goal of what you're looking for than forcing against the bar. So it's originally called Katsu. And that's the guy that invented it. I guess he's pretty jacked for 67 years old, so you, gotta, you know it's going to sell then because you just you have all the middle-aged people say, oh yeah, I've got to try it. I kind of reminded me of the monsters from uh, Pacific Rim, the name of it. But you know, if it sounds cool, it's going to sell. And what does this do? Well, first of all, how many people have seen the kid that you put too much weight on the bar, their form changes horribly, and it's not athletic at all, but they're still doing the weight, and they still join the 500-pound club? How many people think that's beneficial toward the athletic development of that individual? No. So I can take people out from underneath heavy weights and get them to do really good form if they're going to do exercises. Uh, fast twitch muscle fibers, I'm going to show you how they convert fast uh, the, the middle ones to fast twitch. You deal with metabolites in a different way, it's similar to doing 23 second runs. Human growth hormone, re human growth hormone release. Minimal muscle damage from the exercise, very useful for in season when people are beat up anyway, especially during football season, and you have an improved oxygen management. So here's the research, and there's a lot of research on this. The, the Asians are crazy about this. Uh, there's all kinds, so I just picked ones that jumped out at me. Greatly increased growth hormone in IGF-1 and vascular endothelial growth factor. Isn't that great if you get naturally made human growth hormone, you don't have to take it, you don't go to jail or anything like that? Increasing muscle mass more than other ways. Ischemic conditions mean there's no blood flow. And, there, and I'm going to show you why that's going to be important or how, this, how these things are different. Now you're looking at Division I football players, increase 7% in bench, 8% in squat, using 20% of your max with three sets of 30 reps for 45 seconds rest in 40 weeks. How many people think a 7% increase in your bench press in four weeks is pretty good for Division I football players? It's awesome, especially if you're in season and you're all beat up. Now we're in our world, the adolescent, When you take away the oxygen, you increase your muscle, your muscle unit amplitude. I'm guessing because your body thinks it's dying, it's going to fight harder. It's kind of the whole concept behind it. And this is the research that showed that you have a shift from type 1 to type 2 muscle fibers. So you're actually impacting the fast twitch muscle fibers. Slow twitch muscle fibers need oxygen, fast twitch don't, and you're forced to use them. So here's what some people did. Everyone thinks, well, maybe Randy the Macho Man Savage was getting a workout while he was out wrestling when he used to tie the things around his arms. Uh, they take really heavy stuff, wraps, and they close everything off or uh, super pump, put that one on. Uh, you're, you're closing off your, all your blood flow then, and I don't know how safe that is. In fact, the research said that it's not all that safe. So they've come out with newer stuff. Uh, and that's why I like this Be Strong, because the way it works is it folds around and it still allows for blood, throw through, blood flow through your major artery so there's no chance of anything bad happening, but you still get the impact of what, it, what it's supposed to do. And again, stupidly, I didn't listen and I went all out on this thing and I was wrecked. My wife thinks it's hilarious. They strap around pretty easily. Um, and you pump them up, and it's not that much of a pump, but you do get a good pump, and you use light weights. K 
Kale uses them with his hockey team to develop fast switch muscle fibers. He just puts them on a bike and you pedal moderately for 30 seconds, then you rest for 30 seconds and you can't wear these things for longer than 20 minutes. So I go, he goes for about 12 minutes and he has shown with all of his stuff that he's got that it works. Uh, and you do, you use mom weights to do a workout. But it works. Um, it's kind of crazy. So I've been doing, these aren't my guys, but uh, I've been doing them with just boom booms because if I'm, want, if I'm working fast switch muscle fibers, you can do them very easily and it, you get tired pretty quick. I've even done, I go on a mile walk or two mile walk with my dogs and you get tired at the end of two miles. It's kind of wild how it works. Now for my last one as I'm running out of time. I told you I was into Monty Python. Oscillatory isometrics. Anyone familiar with oscillatory isometrics? I think D.B. Hammer was the first one that had them out in his book, World Greatest Strength Training Book, whatever it was. That was the first time I saw them. Uh, but the idea is that you're trying to merge inter and intramuscular co contractions. So you're trying to merge those two balls together. And it's the ability to contract and relax the muscle and main factor in determining the athletic ability of an athlete. Uh, the Russians did research. They had five levels of athletes in their Olympic program. And they probably had the same equipment that Cal has now. But what they found was between four and five, the biggest difference was the ability for an athlete to relax the muscle in movement. The more a muscle can relax, the more it can flex or contract. So think about, in, and that's actually called Sherrington's Law of Reciprocal Innervation. In order for an agonist to contract, an antagonist must relax. They started that with eyes. And they're trying to figure out why people's eyes don't work or move. But it can carry over to any muscle thing. So if you think about it, if I'm flexing my bicep, can I extend my tricep? No, in order to have movement, one of them has to relax, so the other one can flex and relax. How many people have seen that really stiff kid run? He said, dude, if you can just relax when you run, there's somewhere along the line, somewhere in their spine or something, something's not relaxing and so they stay locked down and they can't move. So I stole this from Joel Smith. This is what a split squat looks like with an with a oscillatory fashion. So when he's in that position, in that lunge, he's squeezing his body as hard as he can, and then he's going to let go. And your body's going to naturally fall. And what happens is when it's falling, your muscles don't actually pick the body up and catch it. Your tendons start picking up that energy, and they pop you back into place. So if you see someone that's really stiff or very, not very athletic, they have a really hard time with that. So if you see people who do things like squeeze and relax, squeeze and relax, what they're trying to do is teach the body the very basics of that movement pattern. But that's a very basic one. If you're going to do that, start with nothing. Just get the pattern down. And you will see that it takes a little bit. But what I have found is this is always a great thing that I go to when we're coming from indoors to outdoors and you have that sp awkward spring break week, that 10 days where nobody really knows what's going on. Some people go away. We always come back and we go to oscillatory isometrics and it's a great way to get us ready to sprint outside. You can do it holding dumbbells. Uh, again, you can do these anywhere. If you don't have any space that day, find a chair or just do them without having your back leg up. Okay, you guys ready to get crazy now? <coughs> this is what Cal's working on. So he's got all these things hooked up to people and he's getting EMG results instantly. Has anyone been up to his place? So he's got this, he's got his own weight room, it's big. And then he's got his little office which smells and then he's got like this conference room that's got all this equipment in there. So he's got all these people that work for him. Everyone wants to come volunteer and do all this stuff for him. And he sits there and he watches in that room all these different readings that people have coming up on their charts for whatever they're doing. I think he bought four 1080 sprints and when they're doing that on the ice, he just watches, sits and watches and can tell people what's going on. All right, these are supposed to go as soon as I open them up too. But here's what's happening here. 
He's got rubber bands strung across the, the pins on a rack. This one, he put a rubber band on the bottom, so now you have to use hamstrings in a, as a flexor and an extensor. And he's just barely kicking it. He's got leg weights on the end. Those are two pound leg weights. He has now shifted. Now he uses the, the calf sleeves because he found out that the lighter, the better. So he's doing about 200 grams. But that gave him the highest EMG. These exercises gave him the highest EMG results on any hamstring exercises that they do. And I know it doesn't look like much. Here's another one. Again, he's got the very small movement. It's a squeeze and relax, so it can be a very small movement. Now we're going a little bit harder. Now you're pushing and pulling. So as you push back, you're going into the top band. So you're using quads and hamstrings. See the girl in the back? See her mouth tape shut? <laughs> you go to the next one. Prone soyuz kicks, up and down. Glutes and soyuz reciprocating muscles, right? Hard to train the soyuz. But again, he's got two pound weights or one pound weights or grammed weights on the legs. <coughs> now your foot is in between, so now you're pushing and pulling. And by the way, all these are up on his uh, YouTube channel too. I do that one a lot. I really like that one. And that doesn't look like much, but that's actually really hard. Because again, it's not about how hard you're pulling, it's about the contraction and the relaxation. So hopefully we don't come away with, this is your idea. And hopefully I gave you some ideas or things to think about. Again, you know me, that's always my goal, is to let you go away with things to think about and question what you're doing. <laughs>